Um, I know that most of you know me. I'm Roberta Jaggers. I'm the president of the Library Foundation, but I've been at the foundation since about 2002. So I do remember when Thin Man Little Bird went up, and I remember a little bit about the selection process. So here we are in 2019 celebrating the 10th anniversary of the installation of Thin Man Little Bird, along with the 50th anniversary of the Library Foundation and the 100th anniversary of our summer reading program. So we have a 10, a 5, and a 100, and that's, that's pretty cool. We have some very special guests with us here that we'll talk a little bit about them later, but um, Ann Stack is with us today. She was a member of the selection committee, Brett Waller was the chair of the selection committee, and his wife Mary Lou is with us. We also have with us today Rita Spaulding, who is an artist who's worked with the library and very successful out in Irvington, and of course the man of the hour, Peter Shelton. So we're just really happy to have you here in Indianapolis with us. Uh, we are going to be recording this session for future staff training purposes, so we'll go ahead and get going. Um, I will try to keep my part brief so that you can mainly hear from Peter. And if you all want to go outside later, that's fine. So we covered the first slide already. Okay, so just so you know, this is what we're planning to talk about in, in my part. First of all, a little bit about the history, the history of the architecture of this building, the history of the pedestals, and how and why it took so long for art to be placed there, and how that finally happened. We'll talk a little bit about the public art project, and I'll do my best to give you an overview, but we have two people who were part of that process here, and I've asked them if they don't mind speaking a little bit more to that, if they feel I've missed anything important, so we'll do that. I want to tell you a little bit about how we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of Thin Man Little Bird this year, and then you'll have a chance to hear from Peter Shelton. Uh, here comes Tony Radford, and Tony has really embraced this project. Hi, Tony. Tony. Um, Peter and Anne and Brett and Mary Lou. Tony is the library's artist in residence and he actually has coordinated some student work that will be on display later this evening and that is inspired by Thin Man Little Bird. So that's part of our celebration, so it's a little spoiler alert. Okay, so the history. So as we know for certain that Paul Cray, the architect who designed this 1917 building, always intended for there to be art on the pedestals on the front side of the building. There were some early concepts that were floating around, and the one on the left, this is an image from the library's digital indie collection, and one concept was to make it a World War I memorial. Another opportunity um, that, P that, that um, um, uh, uh, Paul, uh, Paul tried to lob onto because of the economics of it was at one point there was an artist who is proposing a memorial to the pioneer mother. And this is going to be a sculpture of some kind that was going to be in the square across the street. And she came to Central Library to talk to Paul Cray about it. And in a letter to the president of the Board of School Commissioners, which is on the left, um, she, he explained that this project was being built. And he said, by the way, did you know we have these pedestals for this art? Um, but obviously, pioneer mother did not come to pass either. So basically, the sculpture pair remained, I'm sorry, not the sculpture pair, the pedestals remained empty for 92 years. Um, as we go through this, I'll point out some things that are going to be in our digital collection as well. The Library Foundation is part of our 50th, is launching a digital collection. So the one on the left, the photo, is in the libraries. You can already get that online. The one on the left, the letter, will be in our collection, and that's going to be going up soon, okay, but not quite yet. The one on the left is a mock-up. Mock-up. Okay, so the public art project. This was a um, very um, exciting project for the foundation to be part of. It all began around 2003, so we all know back then that is when this building was being transformed, and the library approached the foundation and said, hey, we know nothing about public art, but we would really like for there to be some public art at Central Library. Would you be willing to convene a committee of arts experts who would be willing to help us select art and also potentially assist with the fundraising for the art? And so the foundation said, sure, sounds great. Danny Dean, our previous president, loves art. And so I think that there was a need that the library um, married with a personal interest and he was really passionate about it. So we were fortunate to gain some really heavy hitters in the Indianapolis art world to be part of our committee. So Chairman Brett Waller, I introduced him. Uh, there's a woman named Kathy Campbell, uh, David Russick, Deborah Simon, Joy Summers, and Ann Stack, and John Thompson. And so th those were our group. 
and they actually selected Thin Man Little Bird as well as some other pieces. And I know you've all seen the Central Library Visitor's Guide, but there's a wonderful spread in the middle about public art. And so some of the pieces that were part of this campaign, in addition to Thin Man Little Bird, are this mural here, which is called Our Heartbeat in Our History, and it is by an artist named Tom Trelemke. He did a lot of the tile, the mosaic work at the Indianapolis International Airport, so you can kind of see his swirling forms, and this is loosely based on the Magnificent Ambersons. Really cool. Um, there's also the elevator lobby art. So on P1, we have Lights Word Life, which is the colored art piece um, that um, by Arlen Bayless. And then on the P2, there's one called RIOS, um, which is, uh, stands for Random Information Organization System by Ed Francis. And then, and then so those were the, the four pieces of art that resulted from this public art campaign. But of course, the most ambitious, and you're going to hear about what it took structurally to install it, is Sin Man Little Bird. Okay? So the process that the committee went through was, is my, as I understand, and this is where I'm going to ask you for some um, backup, is that they first of all, among themselves, identified artists that would be suitable for um, Central Library. Then they contacted the artists to gauge their interest in being considered. And when an artist said, yes, I'd like to be considered, then the artists were invited to submit a proposal and we were able to pay them an honorarium for the proposal, which I think is very important when working with artists and honoring their time and the creativity and the effort that would go into putting these proposals together. Um, then the committee met and selected the final pieces. And as part of this process, a very important role of the committee, and I, I don't think I understood this at the time, but I understood this now, that Brett Waller as chair was out there in, in, in a quiet and unassuming way serving it as an ambassador for this project because there were lots of people in the community who needed to get on board with this. You know, the, the War Memorial and the Indiana Historical Preservation Commission and the mayor. And so what he wanted to do was build a groundswell of support among the key influential people so that once the project got up, there wouldn't be something to sub, stub the toe in the process because just the effort of building Thin Man Little Bird and the effort of the engineering was complicated enough. So Brett did a very good job of clearing the politics out of it. So anything you want to add about the process? No, I think you're doing good. Okay, okay. Well, we're just so happy you're here with us today. Um, and so uh, eventually, Thin Man Little Bird was installed and dedicated in April of 2009. And here you can see we got an amazing um, article in Nouveau. And there's Peter, obviously, with his sculpture on the cover. David Hoppe wrote this. And this chronicles the installation process. So this is going to be part of our digital collection, the Library Foundation, soon to open digital collection. So if you want to dig a little bit more into what happened, this is a resource. Another resource that's currently on the library's YouTube channel and will also be in our collection is the video that Randy took. It's about a nine or 10 minute video showing the cranes and the trucks and the installation and, and, and all that stuff. So lots of places where you can dig in and learn a little bit more. Um, community reaction. You know, it was among the among the residents, I think it was a really mixed bag. There were some interesting letters to the editor, and then there were some people who were like, I love it. Um, and then we also got a lot of critical acclaim um, and a really big feather in Indianapolis's cap and the library's cap and Peter's hat and everybody's cap was that Thin Man Little Bird was designated by Americans for the Arts among the 40 best works of public arts in the U.S. and Canada in 2010. So we, and I know that I've talked to colleagues who've gone to national conferences and people have spoken that aren't even from here, have spoken about Indianapolis and their photo is, Central Library, Thin Man, Little Bird. So it is something that our system is really known for. Um, it wasn't obvious to me at first how Thin Man, Little Bird connects to the mission to the library, but it does connect in a way that I think is really compelling. But I'm going to save that for Peter because I think it's cool. Okay. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It was called Americans for the Arts. So we're doing a lot to celebrate this year. You can't let an anniversary go without using it as an opportunity to 
steward an investment that was made by increasing awareness of the sculpture and building relationships with all the people who have been part of the project. So the first thing that we have done, and we actually got to work with Peter and Brett and Ann also helped with this, was we created some interpretive signage to talk about um, the one, in, this is the one that's in front of Thin Man outside. And this talks a little bit about the history and um, the selection process and you know, the, the dimensions of the sculpture and then who was involved in terms of foundry architects, et cetera. And then here are some, um, in the upper left-hand corner, I guess that, is that upper left for you guys? Um, anyway, yes, upper left-hand corner for you all. There's some of those early renderings that, um, that were made by Paul uh, Cray and his company. A similar sign uh, with different content for Little Bird. We also have a very nice display downstairs. I really want to thank Tony Radford for putting that together. We have some of Peter's original drawings and also a lot of books um, that he, art books that he had that, we, that were part of his proposal and we thought very much worth displaying. Um, and then also another project that Tony worked on is student art inspired by Thin Man Little Bird. So this one on the left, and I have to just remind myself, it's Lavender. Okay, the one on the left is called Green Nature. That is the one that's inspired by Thin Man. And then Lavender Nature is on the right. And I'm sure as you all know from mostly being in this building, there is a live fish swimming in Lavender Nature and his name is Soulfish. So I thought that was pretty fun. Um, these were on display as you all know throughout the Meet the Artist display and now are going to be on display at our reception this evening. Okay, I'm going to turn things over to Peter then. There you go. Roberta. You're welcome, sir. Good job. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for coming. Well, I have a feeling some of the staff, you had no choice. <laughs> so, I'll try not to torture you. Uh, and thank you for illustrious guests and Roberta for her uh, good introduction. Um, I actually have a, I'm from, I, I was born in a little town north of Dayton called Troy, Ohio. It was the county seat of Miami County, and uh, Indianapolis was the, but because of my father's war wound, we moved to Arizona when I was very young, uh, but <clears throat> have a long history with both Southwest Ohio and Indiana. My dad, who was shot in the head in the Battle of the Bulge, paralyzed on his right side, was rendered both paralyzed on his right side, but couldn't speak. He had aphasia, so he spent a couple years at Purdue in language retraining to learn how to talk again and so my family had lived in this area um, and for a couple of years while he was in that rehab and and we had lots of friends over here and then my next uh, interaction with Indianapolis was um, through a guy named Robert Rowans. Roman some of you may remember uh, Robert who was the director of the Heron Art Gallery and I'd met him at the County Museum in LA years before, several years before, and he was incredibly enthusiastic about a work that I had made originally for University of Massachusetts in Amherst called Floating House Dead Man, and it was a roughly footprint 50 by 60 foot house made of wooden paper that hung from the ceiling, held aloft by cables attached to, via pulleys, to 14 very heavy counterweights that held it in the air such that two people could walk inside of it at any one moment. And, but as you can imagine, since it wasn't tethered to the floor, your movement would be like being on a creaky ship. And my original, I think the third installation of that particular work was in a, a former motor, motor pool building for the university. It's now gone. But it was kind of a spectacular setting because it was big open loft, lofted space. And out in the middle of this pool of light was this building floating house. And then all the cables ran like something in a, um, midway at the fair, you know, where the strings go off some other place, to another room where all the objects, all these things, um, were collected and held collectively the building aloft. And I think at that time I made some uh, some allies, if you will, who had seen that had seen that work and had been mightily impressed, uh, and uh, amongst them Holly and, and others. And so this the uh, uh, that sort of was a little bit more history for you here in, in the city. Um, the Greek Revival, which this building is a shining example of, in fact, as I was saying to Roberta this morning, 
Um, a lot of federal buildings are also, you could say, roughly Greek Revival, but they're sort of Greek Revival typically on steroids. They're just like, geez, you know, they get this sort of federal style which has this huge exuberant and um, meant to display its power as the representative buildings of our government. Uh, this building is incredibly subtle. In fact, Evans Wallen, the architect for the remodel and the addition, said to me, he says, it's really an Egyptian building. It's not really, um, you wouldn't really call it Greek Revival because of its subtlety and because in a certain way, a more archaic colonnade and other things, and, and which gives it its beauty. Plus, it has a certain, I wouldn't call it delicacy, but it is a kind of a delicate building. So. Um, it has a lightness to it that very, seems very special in terms of the proportions and everything. You know, Paul Cray made a number of other wonderful buildings in the world, the Rodin Museum in Philadelphia, a bunch of bu buildings at the University of Texas, and various places, as well as the, the original building for the Detroit Institute of the Arts was, was his design as well. And of course the World War came along, Second World War, First World War, and the result was they, I don't know if that was the main reason we didn't get the pedestals appointed, but I have a feeling that, you know, they ran out of money. Um, I was also informed by the historical restoration people, the architects and RC engineering, that the building was, was made by a couple different ethnicities, right? So I can't remember whether it was the Romanians on one side and the Italians on the other. And they said, you'll observe that neither side of the building are made the same way inside, because it's basically a, a brick building, masonry building that's clad in limestone. But if you go to the guts of it, <laughs> the, the brickwork on one side is different than the other. So the things actually are kind of stacked up in ways that, are, that were ethnically specific, because there were these different groups that had come to, to build the building in the first place. On the outside, it's uniform, but the inside is the, oh, look at this. You see, they, they laid their bricks differently. So, and I got to know that intimately, because when um, I was approached for the project, and I think it's true of a lot of contemporary artists, we're either indifferent to Beaux-Arts tradition, which was radically kind of superseded by modernism, particularly after the Second World War, because you had all these sort of uh, uh, European emigre like, like uh, Mies van der Rohe and, and others who came and really changed the whole appearance of architecture in the world. Up to the Second World War, the, the Greek Revival, the style of neoclassical architecture that, that um, was dominant, and most contemporary artists are either ignorant, and that's probably often, or indifferent or even contemptuous of the Beaux-Arts. And I never had this feeling about it. I just thought I couldn't figure out a way to apply myself to it, right? It just, it seemed so period specific. Uh, and so when I was first asked to make a proposal, I was trying to figure out a way to be respectful of and there's a protocol, there's a whole program for the Greek Revival. The fact that the building had no sculpture was completely wrong. Because the, the, the building is a kind of backdrop, like a theater backdrop. It's a proscenium in which the characters, the actors, are the sculpture. Absolutely primary. So the idea that it would have been, one of the pedestals would turn into a, like a little war memorial or something. Great for the war memorial, but it just would sort of be like a minor aside. You know, it'd be like a small side chapel in a Catholic church, you know. They really needed to have something that, that really used the backdrop of the building and, and a, a certain blankness that the building had which made it perfect for something special to be enacted on the front of it. Um, and then, and then how, but how to make something that was of this moment, you know, and, and still be respectful. So, yes, bronze, we'll have it be bronze, that would be a typical thing. But how do I make something that somehow, we're, we're, we're how to, how to bring it into this moment, if you can. I mean, I know that's, and, and, and it's not something that I, as I said to Roberta today, I have a lot of ideas about the significance of the work, but probably more in retrospect than I did at the time. I really kind of feel my way through these things. A lot of it's initially just kind of a formal response to the building. And something that I'd done in the past as well, like for, for years I've avoided putting things on pedestals. It was a kind of um, contemporary art no-no in, in a funny way. It was because the pedestal, in a way, is a kind of stage or proscenium. And the whole idea of, of most art since the 60s, at least sculpture, has been that sculpture is in your space with you. And you know, you bump into it. You might even interact with it. You might climb on it. It's not, depic it's not like looking through a proscenium at actors enacting some narrative, and you identify with them empathically, 
and you understand what's going on, but it's not acting upon you directly. Whereas this kind of concept of the sculpture getting off the pedestal and being very directly in your space is a major part of what post-Second World War uh, contemporary sculpture was about. So here I am faced with pedestals. I've for years hung things from ceilings and off of walls and up on poles, anything to get it off of a pedestal. Um, so I initially had a project that I had done for the Lannan Foundation in Florida, which was um, uh, in an old theater where they had created two pedestals. And I said, oh, blow me down, pedestals, OK. So my first response was, well, I'm going to float one, something on top of one of those pedestals. It won't touch the pedestal. It'll just hang over the pedestal. And it was this, this thing was called stretch spread. The spread was almost like a vascular structure. I was a pre-med student at one point in college. My grandfather in Ohio um, in Troy was a little small town doctor. And um, I thought, well, I'll have this kind of vascular structure that's a little bit tree-like on its side, a little bit like a human figure. And then the other figure, I, I guess I could have it there very self-contained on its pedestal and sit it on the pedestal. But I thought, well, let's have this thing stretch out into the architecture. And most of my early work was rather architectural. So I stretched this figure out to 26 feet right up into the skylight that it was over its head. Uh, if I could have, I would have popped it out the skylight, but I got stopped on that one. Um, so two different ways of responding to the sculpture, two different ways of thinking, one kind of defying its pedestal or creating the pedestal as a kind of non-pedestal, and the other one kind of rising up out of the building where you, where's this going? So it, both of them kind of made their object um, politely sitting on a pedestal difficult for you. So I already had this thing thinking about this one here. And I started thinking, well, how can I make a figure? And I was given a little drawing initially. I don't know who gave it to me. I have to find out. I hope it wasn't signed. I know Evan said not, of, a, of, a, of the front of the reading room on the west side here, with a little dotted line like, don't go outside of the dotted line. And it was very polite. It was within the frame underneath the architrave and the medallions there. And I thought, you know, I, I didn't. I looked around. I tried to find who, who gave this to me. It was, put, it was in my pocket at the end of the day. And uh, no, it wasn't. But I just, it was something in the materials that I got. And I thought, oh, boy. you know, Because my first response is, I'm going to go outside of the frame of the building. Right? There's no way to create anything, nor would I want to create something so massive that it could even possibly compete with this, these very beautiful, you know, the inertia of the building so beautifully proportioned, but it's all sitting on the ground, very rectitudinous. And I, I said, I want to go outside of the building somehow. So I knew I could probably go outside of the building and create something that didn't compete with the building, but at least challenge the building a little bit by, by dealing with it graphically. So that's where this idea of a very tall figure came from. But the figure also, you have to remember that the Greek revival was, came out of, you know, neoclassicism, and there would be this sort of, you know, you would ideally have this, you know, Hellenic, beautiful, figure that would be sitting on the pedestal, beautifully proportioned. And, uh, and I started thinking, well, let's just push Helen up into a vine. So that's what happened to Helen. And the other one, I started thinking, you know, the Greek revival also obviously played very much on the sort of platonic idea of kind of perfection of, of form and perfection of, of, of um, you know, and, and the platonic forms of the, the, the sphere and the pyramid and the cube. and. I started thinking, what's, what's a contemporary platonic form? Well, that would be, somebody would say it's a donut, I guess. It's a torus in, in mathematics. It's basically, um, and it's, it is the structure, it postulates the structure, because we only know it because we can't see it, of black holes. So the, 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 the way material and debris is being collected in and around a black hole, which we can't see, is essentially a kind of donut. Um, and it, it, basically a torus is a circle that's that is rotated around the center. And so that's where you come up with the form. And so I started thinking, well, and I also liked the fact that it had this celestial astronomical kind of quality, but it was also kind of like a little halo that would sort of hang out over its pedestals. So I had this idea that it had just, had just come in, it's like a spaceship, lit upon the building, and then was off again. But it also had this sense of, of the universe. And I thought, well, this is perfect for the library, because the library is a kind of universe of knowledge and information. And, um, but n none of this, this is not like I start off thinking these things and then I illustrate it. It's more like I, I feel my way into these things, which is half an intellectual process and half 
an intuitive process, and a lot of it's just responding to the, the, the sort of shape, size, proportions of the building. For example, the little bird really came initially because I said I, that thing, I, know, I guess I can say this on the camera, a bird's going to get on that thing and shit on it in a minute. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, you know, it actually seems to be pretty clean, doesn't it? It doesn't tend to get a lot of birds on it. Well, that's maybe like putting a scarecrow on it. And then I thought, well, I'll just put a little bird on it right off, you know. <laughs> and, and, and we'll just, you know, and then... And the, but uh, I think also I did have this idea that the bird... Originally I'd called the thing, instead of Thin Man, Little Bird, I, I, I think I called it Little Bird at the Edge of the... I call it Thin Man, Little Bird at the Edge of the Universe. So it was a little bit of an idea that the bird was a stand-in for us um, as just a little living being at the, end of the, at the edge of this vast kind of circumstance. And obviously the library perfectly is such a collection of human universe, you know. And so I think that's where the bird came into play on it. And, um, and that's a fun one too because I have people, once they've seen the little bird, um, will tell me that they're up there in the, what's the tower? The big one there? The, yeah, yeah. The, I was up in the I-Force Tower and I saw the little bird and I said, did you? And yeah, I could see it from there. And I thought, this is like what you used to in the 50s where you're up in a plane and say, I can see my house from here. Can you, <laughs> you know? and, and, I, and most of the time, well, you know it's there, but you probably can't see it. But um, um, the, pro, a little bit about the process of getting it done. I uh, was always a builder as a kid, a, you know, manic builder, always making things. And, uh, uh, and I, was, I was telling Roberta that when I would go to my aunt's place in Lake Tahoe, I would typically uh, say hi to her and then walk right past her and go to the trash bin and pick out whatever cardboard and egg, bo egg, egg boxes and anything was there and I'd take it out into the woods and that's where I'd spend my day. Um, and she would come out and say, do you want lunch? And I said, well, I can't take a break. This is really important. And she said, well, I'll bring you a sandwich. And uh, so I had grown up uh, in Arizona, as I said, but my Father's mother was uh, a Studebaker, and the uh, same family as your South Bend Studebakers, and uh, they were descendants of three blacksmiths that came from Solingen, Germany in, the, in 1736, and distributed out into the world. And my father's first cousins were these very, very clever Mennonite engineers and, and, and fabricators, and they started off on the farm, but they could make anything. And I worked for them in the summers, and uh, Troy's also the, the home of Hobart Brothers Welding Company, and I went to the trade school there for six months after I got out of college and worked for um, worked as an industrial welder, pipe welder at you know, Dow Chemical in Midland, Michigan. And so I had this real construction background, which is one of the reasons why I've been able to, in certain ways, have things and see to and actually make things that are probably in advance of my art world pay grade, so to speak, I mean, in terms of prominence. When I was young, I could make all these things, and, and I didn't really have the art political clout to do it, but I could do it, and that was one way to sort of do an end run on, on having those opportunities. So I've always been kind of half an engineer myself, and when we were considering this project, I knew everybody would say, wow, it's a masonry building, and you've got these big heavy things that are just going to leverage, you know, pull the building down. There's no tensile strength to the building. It's just piles of mortar and brick and limestone. So, um, and my other Midwestern story I was telling Roberta was this, that, that I, I came to the meeting after a number of years, it was six years or so, because we weren't sure how to, you, you, you got the proposal, then you, try, you got sort of stuck trying to figure out how to pay for it. And then there were certain individuals who, at some point said, oh, hell, let's just go ahead and do it. <laughs> Between the foundation and the stacks. So that got done. Uh, but I knew there was a very important meeting where we were down to brass tacks about could we really do this. And I was sitting with all the historic preservation people, the, the engineers, uh, the, the library foundation people, and, and Brett, whoever were there. And I thought, you know, we started whatever in the morning or noon. If I get through the afternoon without somebody saying, you know, Peter, we really like this, as weird as it is, we really like this, but I just I don't think we can do it. I mean, that's, you know, it's buildings pile of 
stone and brick, and I don't know how we're going to physically, you know, we're not going to put some big structure on the outside of the building and hold these things up, and you can't just glue them to the wall, so, you know, I don't know if you can really do it. And I kept thinking, if I get through the day without somebody saying that, it's going to happen, so, because if you're in L.A. or New York, somebody say, ah, oh, no problem, we're going to do this tomorrow. You ready to go? We're going to do it today, right? You ready to do it right today? And then, you know, two months later, you call them and say, what happened? Aren't we going to do this? And they'd say, are you out of your mind? We're not going to do anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I also had warned, and I wish I could remember his name, the young guy from RC, uh, an engineer, um, to bring some, you know, clothes, because we were going to crawl around in the building. Because I also have learned through the years that people say, oh, there's no drawings, or I, I've never been up in the attic, I don't know what's up there, or, you know, you never can do it. I'm not even sure... I'm sure somebody knew, but I'm not even sure they knew there were two separate masonry walls in the, in the reading rooms. There's an inner and outer one. And I knew I don't know, there was a space between there, so we went up into the attic crawling around. Sure enough, there was a nice size space between the, inner, the outer masonry wall, the inner masonry wall, and you know, the engineer and I concluded, yeah, we could get some steel through that space. And in so doing, essentially a, a football uh, goalpost has been inserted into the building through that space between the inner and outer masonry wall, tied to the foundation below, tied to the, the ceiling, the roof uh, structure above. They had to redo the, they're going to do the re redo the roof anyway, so poke a couple holes in it, we suddenly had structure. And through which, attached to which would be this big stainless steel 10 by 10 inch uh, projection coming out of the wall. That's for Thin Man. And then I mean, for, 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 little, for um, little Bird and for Thin Man, we were crawling around on our knees in the catacombs of the building, which are just these half backfilled concrete foundations, and trying to see if we could see where the pedestal for uh, on the west side emerged into the foundation. And sure enough, we could actually get in there and look up from below. It was a chimney that went up through a, a masonry, again, a masonry constructed structure that's skinned in limestone on the outside, but it's actually hollow with a, with a limestone cap on it. So again, the engineer and I said, yeah, we can, we can drop something down through this, this hole. So that, suddenly we were in the chips. We had some opportunity to, to figure out a way to attach this structure to the building, kind of with the idea that if the building fell down around it, the structures would still be standing. That was <laughs> kind of the idea, that you definitely didn't want to have the sculpture itself acting as a, you know, as the, the tip of a whip, if you will, start shaking around in an earthquake, you know, I, we had to approve this for earthquakes. Do you have earthquakes here? Yeah. Yeah. It turns out you're in a zone, so mm -hmm. be careful. Anyway, whipping around and actually, or in a, in a windstorm, you know, wind, whipping around up there and actually sort of pull the building down or start s smacking the, the architrave of the building and actually start breaking up the building. So that's what we had to get through engineering-wise. A um, little bit about the process. Am I talking about this too much? Are you? Yeah, all right. Okay. Process of making it is uh, was um, to um, create first a model for Thin Man, which I did analog, old-fashioned, constructed a 12-foot version of him or her. Not gender-specific, by the way, uh, and. Um, and then to enlarge it digitally, so we scanned it and enlarged it. And um, at some point, I'll have for Roberta in the online archive, you know, this is marvelous things that the 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 that uh, my digital guy did, where he figured out a way to make the thing in modules five lifts. So it's 44 feet tall, and I had, but there's no way to work on something 44 feet tall. So we scanned it and we set it up so that it was we lodged within five frames, um, essentially a kind of foam material, and then they carved into that foam from two sides with a, essentially a big router that works on, on three axes, and carve Thin Man within those volumes. And because they were all managed on a computer, they all, re they all registered one to the other. And then we tethered the foam parts with steel to the legs and the arms to the edges of the frames and then removed all the excess material. So eventually you had a 44 foot tall, five module high version of Thin Man lodged within these, these um, steel frames. 
They're covered with plaster, refined, stacked, reconciled to each other so that the transitions were all kind of perfect. And at the same time, we submitted the original scan to the engineers. And the engineers wanted to be able to test it. And the problem with, with something like Thin Man is, as the engineers would say, they're pre, it's pre-broken. You know, you made something that's meant to break because instead of being you know, a nice tripod or something else where all the legs were rigid, you have legs that are wrapping around the back of the other leg. You know, it's meant to fall down. That's what you've made is something to fall down. So you want us to engineer it so it won't fall down. And what we were able to do is by scanning it and introducing it into a, into a computer stress environment w through a program, they were actually able to test and have these marvelous drawings where every six inches they, they, they were able to actually calculate the, essentially the tendency for the thing to want to break at that point all the way up each, all of the legs. And through that they could specify, because that's bronze, but the bronze by itself is not considered structural. So, it's cast, it's a, it can be a little brittle, the welds are not totally dependable, it has some engineering value, but mostly all of the legs have stainless steel running through them. So we had to figure out a way to not only introduce the stainless steel in there without really changing the aesthetic and the proportions of the work, and at the same time um, hold the, building, hold the, the um, uh, thin man aloft. And so it's a, it was kind of an amazing process in a way, and, and fun in a way. And fun for me because I actually understand it you know, which, and in fact, not only understand it, because of my background, I was, a, the engineer would say, well, we need this or that, and the, the founder would say, yeah, you, you want 200 feet of some particular stainless steel that, that the mill will only make in $100,000 order, right? And so you're not going to get that material. It's in the book but you can't get it. So I was able to go back and forth to the engineer and say, look, can we do this or do that? And, you know, can we, can we make this thicker wall and thinner uh, OD with something that's available? The engineer also had something like 12,000 additional welds that we had to do because we had to unify the exterior bronze skin to the stainless steel inside. And I said, there's no way we're going to do that. We have to figure it. So hook or crook, that all got made. And, uh, and we didn't, uh, we didn't break the bank on that. And the foundry was able to get it done in time. So um, I don't know if you know about it. It's probably made, Thin Man's probably made in maybe close to 150 separate pieces of bronze. So those big frames with the original plaster covered pattern parts were all molded. And then in lost wax casting, if you know how that works, you make a, a wax. Uh, basically facsimile of the final work. That's invested in a heat resistant material, usually ceramic material, like a slurry of ceramic that they invested in. They gate it, they, they put in wax uh, inlets, if you will, where the, where the bronze will be introduced and then you have the, essentially you fire it in a kiln and you end up with a piece of like pottery. And it's, it's hollow because you've burned all the wax out and it becomes a cavity into which you can put the molten bronze. And when you're done, you break off the ceramic shell and you have a bronze part. And 150 parts have to be welded together systematically with the stainless steel at the same time going through it. Each of those welds have to be very precise. And that's all done in another frame that looks just like the first one next to it. So we just, they use that as a kind of map. They can measure in from the sides of the frame to keep track of where the form is as it emerges up through the frame. It also becomes a structure to install the work. So if you see Randy's video, you'll see how Randy uh, documented the installation of Thin Man, which kind of came in its frame. It was erected vertically in its frame, and then we used the frame as a way of picking it up and putting it on the pedestal, bolting it down, and then removing the frame. So there's a lot of parts to the puzzle that have to be worked out. And um, again, I'm not perfect. I mean, I'm sure it could be done. You just have to, would have had to throw another several hundred thousand dollars at it to get somebody else to figure it all out. Um, because it, 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 I think it, it's a, it's, it's a funny combination of what I do between what I do as a technical person and what I do as an artist. The, the, the two things have to be kind of close together. Little Bird is a big, 5,000 pounds, a lot of leverage as you can imagine. Um, it, we made one eighth of it with a, what's called a CNC machine, which is called a uh, computer, numerical, uh, computer numerical control which basically, we, we, in that case, we just made in a computer environment one-eighth of what is a torus. 
and then we, we cut it in foam and we made a mold from it. So that is a negative of it. And into the negative they were able to form the wax for it. They were also able to divide the wax. Each of the eight sections had 64 parts uh, of, of wax and gate them. That is, they had to put all the gating on, which is, again, this is, the, you put um, rods of wax on it. When we move, they become uh, cavities and channels through which the molten bronze is introduced into the cavity. They cast all of the parts, and then they used the, the mold again to put the parts back, the bronze parts back into that mold and tack them all together. Because you can imagine that if you just started trying to put together several hundred individual tiles, if you will, to put the, that at some point you could have some major dental problems, you know, like big overbite, you know, where you, you come over here and I thought you were going here and you're going to here and you, you know, it's, this is like you have, um, so it, it, helped, it helped us make eight subsections of the of little bird so that they were registered and much easier to reconcile as whole because you look at it in the sun and stuff, you really can't, you'd think you'd see lots of funny dimples and, you know, depressions and everything, but they, put it together perfectly. And it's not structural either, so inside of it is a big hoop of stainless steel, very heavy walled engineered stainless steel that runs through the center of it with, with struts that go out from it to support the bronze. And then there was a complement to the big 10 inch stud that came out of the wall, a big receiver of similar size. And so we slid that over that and that's the way it was mounted into place. Most of that stuff is in the, in the video, so it's fun that way. Um, the part for the receiver and the stud were, um, they were never matched. They were done conceptually in the shop, but for some reason I think we sent the stud off right away because it had to be incorporated into the building. And the guys fabricating in Seattle hadn't fabricated the receiver yet, and I just never saw the two parts together to know that they would fit. And uh, it worried me immensely that we'd get out here with the crane and everything, and we'd go to put it, the two parts together and it just didn't fit. It was just, you know, the, the, the receiver was too small. And I was telling Roberta that the, the, the installers, who were really great guys, uh, I called them one day after they had gotten um, Little Bird, and I wanted them to measure the stud on the building and measure the receiver and make sure that they fit. And the guy called me back and says, I don't know, Peter, I don't know, you know uh, might not work. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you, I, I'll strangle you. I'm not there, but I'll show you. you no, know, he says, it'll, it'll fit, it'll fit. But, um, <laughs> but, but it was like, oh, man. And uh, we, we, we actually had to, I know it sounds somewhat dirty, it isn't, but uh, it's, uh, we had to lubricate the parts and make sure they fit. And, and uh, I had to create a, there's a set of bolts both to pull the part. You know, you could get it started on the crane, but it's a little cattywampus. You wanted it pretty much in, in an attitude where it would, be parallel in, in, in the right trajectory to get it onto the, the building projection. But, um, I, you know, the last few inches I wasn't sure it was going to work. And it's not like you get up there with a hammer and tap it into place. So there actually were bolts that were, that were attached through the little bird to the, to the receiver, the, I mean, the stud coming off the building. So the last few inches you could actually use a wrench and pull it right into place. So that last couple inches. But there were also alternately bolts to push it away if it got stuck. Because, you know, to get it off, it wasn't like you'd get up there with a bunch of guys and wiggle it off the building, you know. And, and if for any reason, for some reason in the future, there was some sort of damage or something else, one could actually pull it off the building still. So we had, these are all the little things that you had to think about. So you get it on there, what happens, you have to get it off. So, so there's a porthole up there, too. So I didn't make an apartment in it, though. So <laughs> anyway, those are some of the, some of the things to deal with. And I... Um, um, thrilled with the way it came out. I have many artist friends, particularly some public art people, who said, how did you get away with doing that? <laughs> how was it that they let you put something like that on their building, you know? And I said, well, I don't know. I had, to, I had, some, uh, I had some support, I had some fans. I, I, I don't underrate both the, 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 you know, the, the financial support and goodwill from the Stacks and from the foundation, but, you know, Brett, in his professorial way, went around and, you know, this guy coming in, very unassuming, I'm sure, sure, and sits down and sit, talks to the colonel. Was he a colonel? Whose province is the, the mall here? He said it wasn't military, it didn't matter. 
He said, as long as you, yeah, I didn't do anything embarrassing in the military. And, he said, and I, I think you even said, technically, this isn't in their province. But it's obviously visually in the province. So. And he also said, you know, I'm already having trouble with people who don't like the obelisk. They think it's the, the devil's work or, or, or Calder's, you know, flute, you know, the naked people dancing around, dancing around the uh, pan there. Um, so as long as, you know, this is nothing, not a problem. But I think that Brett, Brett navigated through a lot of people who could have been, you know, could have been very negative. So I think that when it actually happened, I'm sure there was negative responses, but it was, um, uh, it felt um, like it was, it landed, you know, rather perfectly. So anyway, I thank Indianapolis and all those involved, and I can answer any questions you have. <laughs> no, no, you know, going down the street yeah. vertically? No, it was like lying on We had this big, okay, so I, I, I fabricated this, all, the pattern in a steel frame. Same thing with the sculpture. So it was, we used the steel frame, the two steel frames stood next to each other and they used one to map out the parts for the other as we put it together. And then they just had it supported within that frame. It was basically a big truss work. With, was it built in Indianapolis? Or was it built like no, it's, no, I have a foundry, it's called Blue Mountain Fine Art in, in North uh, East Oregon. And um, a guy named Tyler Fouts, who's the who's the uh, who's the foundry man, and just this brilliant guy. You know. okay. And then it was like on a flatbed. Yeah, a Landstar truck yeah. brought here. Okay. Yeah, just a big truck. Just curious, and uh, Little Bird, Little Bird, Little Bird's about 11 feet in diameter. Yeah. I'm trying to think whether it it passed, but it was a wide load. Okay. It was on the same truck, okay. but a little bit wide, but not not, not too much wider. Uh, Blue Mountain. Um, I think that the beginning to end of the foundry work is probably about eight months, maybe. Yeah. And how often were you there physically? Um, well, the, the course of the fabrication, I was probably there four or five times. Okay. I mean, they don't really need me. They're, I mean, they. Yeah, once they're rolling. Yeah, they really know what they're doing. You know, it used to be that foundries were run by, you know, recovering hippies. You know. Uh, and and tended to be slightly on the burnout side, and you would show up, and they would be three or four days late. These guys are really good, so it's just they they tell you what they can do, and then they do it. So. Yeah. Peter, when you when people look at you, you want them to think what a great tech, feat of technology this must be, and how it's you know, what the structure is inside, or what, or how would you like? To this is one of my conflicts with instant media, right? I mean, instant Instagram right now. So I have a. My web person says, you have to be on Instagram every day, and there has to be pictures of you at all times, you know? And, um, and all about the process. Well, to me, um, a child of the 60s, you know, the, uh, I'm not interested in the... I, it's a, it is marvelous what I do from a technical point of view, but I don't... I don't that's not the point of it, you know? The point of it is to, to go, wow! You know, and it might have some component of saying, wow, uh, technically, but mostly just like wow, just like I want. To, that's the way I want to feel when I see something. Uh, I don't want to know how hard it was to make it. You know, I want to actually, if anything, I want it to look like you walking along and it just dropped out of the sky. You know, or you you literally drawn the thing on the side of the building. You know, I want. And, and interestingly, now with computers, uh, I'm able to have something that's very gestural that came out of a drawing on the scale of a piece of paper and have that same sort of fluidity and grace in the 44-foot figure. And in years past, I've done other tall figures where you enlarge it, but it's the, there's something about the enlarging part without using the computer where you're kind of doing it in the old analog way where it just invariably has a certain stiffness to it. It loses some of that, some of the just, you know, graceful wobble that it has. So, um, yeah, it's, so I do post things that are, you know, about process, but and, it's, and the processes are often elaborate for what ultimately you want to be just like something that you just think, ah, oh, just this, you know, where'd you, where'd you find that? I was just driving along the road and it was right there. You know, rather than, rather than in, well, sort of half sticking out of the ground. That's what you'd like to have, but I mean, it's just, you know, it's, um, stuff is so personality driven these days that it's, um, that, it, that it's a little bit of a conflict, but I kind of understand it a little bit too, you know, so. I spent an hour with my stylist before I came in. 
<laughs> anyway, a little bit of makeup, it's fine. What were you going to say, ask? Um, I often give uh, tours of the building to kids, and I had a kid ask one time, what kind of bird is it? So I was wondering if there's a particular bird that inspired you. It's a sparrow. A sparrow. Um, <laughs> He wrote a beautiful, Brett wrote a beautiful piece in and around this, as he would. He's the historian, so. What was your quote from the Bible? I thought, wow, that's really, that's giving it to me. Anyway, something about Christ and the sparrows. I thought, man, that's good. I just grew up with zillions of sparrows, so. Um, then I had somebody else counsel me. You know, sparrows are kind of a nuisance, you know. Are they as bad as, as uh, uh, what's the other English bird that came, that they brought with them that could cause a lot of, um, not blackbirds, but. Um, Starlings, there you go. And so, you know, somebody said, you know, ecologically, sparrows are kind of hard on other birds because they're very, they're kind of invasive. But I, I think I just wanted the sort of common small bird that, and that bird, I know this will sound really weird, that bird came from a cheap Michael's styrofoam thing that wasn't very good and a real sparrow because I was the kind, I, I, I still, my freezer have frozen snakes and sparrows and lots of stuff that I, when I lived in Arizona, we'd you know, do creepy things like that, keep them. And so, um, so that sparrow's a combination of kind of like the generic thing you get in the craft store, but then with the wings and the tail and torn off and the beak taken off and then real beak and real wings and real tail. And then some work with wax to sort of give it the final full sparrow, so. You said the, the diameter is 11 foot. Right. So it's got to be a decent sized sparrow. It's no, it's a, no, it's a tiny, really? yeah. Okay. You haven't seen it out there yet. Well, yeah, I've seen it, but I just. You think it's bigger than. I don't know. Like, no, it's a standard sparrow. It's a okay. standard issue sparrow. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I thought it was like the size of your head or something. <laughs> oh, I thought about that. Well, yeah, size is all. That's an interesting problem, of course, too, because when we were doing the. I have a fiberglass version of composite version of Little Bird in my studio, and it's like having a ship in a bottle. Like, Holy moly. But, you know, up in the building, it's, it's pretty relatively modest, you know. But that's a hard thing to judge, how to get the right um, size of the work for the building. Evans, um, yes, the architect for both the restoration here and the, and the, and the, and the addition that we're standing in, um, came up to me, I think, at the opening, and he said, I knew you were going to do that. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, it went way above the parapet. And you told us it was going to be 26 feet tall or something. And it's 44. And I said, he said, I knew you were going to do that. And this is that bother. And I said, did that bother you? He goes, no, no, it's perfect. But. <laughs> I just didn't want it to get lost in the building. And it, like I said, you, you have such a lovely building. How do, you, how do you make something that makes an impact that, that sort of both works with the building at the same time kind of puts a little pressure back on the building. Because yes, you could, you could put an old-fashioned bronze sculpture on it. It would be very in keeping and fine. And, there, and there, are people, there are artists out there that make such, you know, that do monument sculptures and nothing wrong with it. In fact, some of my favorite Sunday afternoon museum clothes stuff to do when I'm in Europe or somewhere is either go to a graveyard or go to, go to a you know, public park and look at at old monuments, I, I find them quite, um, you know, quite, um, it's like time travel in a weird way. So the idea that these two things maybe refresh the building for another hundred years is kind of great, you know, so that, you know, refresh it as in the sense that you have, you know, as you were talking about this, the Greek revival out there is pretty mixed up, you know, I mean, it's like you've got federal style and you've got, you know, Greek, you've got, uh, we're talking about in the mall there. It's, and everybody says, oh, it's all neoclassical. Well, the tr truth is, it's neoclassical over a long period of time. A lot of it's pretty different. And in the, in the day, so different that it would be a little bit like arguing with one of my sculptor friends who's 20 years older than me or you know, 20 years younger in terms of what, what's more interesting or important. Um, so the, um, yeah, so I, 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 I am kind of amazed that it got done, but I think that it was a very good confluence of interest and goodwill and uh, vision. Usually doesn't happen that way. Anything else I can? Well, I guess I have a question. So sure. I understand now um, how each of them, how you came to the concept for each of them and what they represent. How, how are they working as a pair together? They might not. 
<laughs> no, I think I've always done a lot of work where, like Floating House Deadman that I did here, where, where I, I'm kind of interested in polarities of things and interested in how two things are a contrast because they, they, um, they represent two different ways of thinking about something. You know? And uh, I was at lunch talking about a brother who's a poet of mine and I, uh, a poet, uh, and, and I often think our work is simpatico, not necessarily in terms of the specific ideas, but because I think there's a, uh, almost an ethical, an ethos, an ethical similarity between the way we both approach our work. And in his poetry, you, I can read a passage and I will, I will not necessarily know specifically what's to follow, but I know that when he writes one thing, there's a price to pay for it with something else. So there's always this feeling of, so if you write something that's sweet or poignant or dear or even delicate, I know there'll have to be some other place where it's going to be a little bloody and a little tough. It just has to be because that's the price at least he and I paid in life, you know, with what we lived through, where in order to have those very lovely things, you had to have something else that was going to be, that's what you pay for it, you know, we're surrounded by it all the time as we get older. So, um, so how are they related? There were two different ways for me to think about the Greek revival. One is to have this Hellenic, you know, neoclassical sculpture that I pushed one way by pushing it up out of the architecture and kind of literally kind of taking off like a rocket out of the architecture. And the other one was, in a weird way, to ignore the building, the weight of the building and everything, and think about weight instead of something that rose up and sort of transcended the building and the gravity of the building by a graphic gesture, was the other one where it just seemingly wasn't attached to the building. It just kind of came in like, like space debris and landed for a moment and took off. So there are two different ways of thinking about how to respond to the gravity and the weight and the rectilinear, rectilinearity of the building but just different ways, you know. And one was the more traditional kind of humanist, intense vision of ourselves on a pedestal, and the other one was more our, the more contemporary view, which we have, which we're, which we're part of the universe, you know. And, and so our gravity is more diffused in the world, and we're just a little part of it, rather than just being this massive figure constellated on a pedestal heroically displayed, you know. So it just, it was just two different ways of thinking about, and I think that the little bird by itself would just be too groovy, you know. I mean, it just would be really, that's so groovy that it could be so cool, you just, you know what I mean? And then the other one is, it, it has all the sort of human striving part, you know, all this stuff. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, my brother, I was talking about this today, my brother's a poet. He travels with a notepad and a couple books, that's it. I'm, I'm like Siegfried and Roy coming to town, you know. So the, the, all this effort we make physically to make something and for our ultimate sort of, you know, anthill transients is kind of a contradiction. But then, you know, that's what our lives are like anyway. We get up and brush our teeth and do all the things we do every day, even though we're on our way to someplace else, you know. So, um, no, that's all. I'm sorry, not more rational than that, but that's kind of the way I thought of it. And the other thing is, I guess if it was rational, why would you come back and look at it again? So the whole point of it for me is, I'd like to button it up and have you understand it, but if you could understand it, you could walk away understanding it and had no reason to come back, there would be no reason for making the sculpture. And the whole point of making art, in my opinion, is not to give you an answer, it's to, you know, to, you know, be a threshold into something else to sort of give you something to work on and never quite, never quite perfectly perfect because I didn't perfectly, you know, so. It seems very definitive when you make it big and made out of bronze and it's attached to the building, but, you know, it's still, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have more of a temporal feel to it. I didn't want it to be like official, you know, um, important, significant sculpture on a pedestal. I wanted it to feel like it's in, in some kind of flux so that, and, and at the same time, be res respectful because I love this building. It's a fantastic building. So, you know. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. You're all excused. Thank you. Thank you.